Right then. Um, everyone can hear and everybody is here, so we can uh, get started. Welcome to those of you who've joined us at an MCC Brussels event before. Welcome back to those of you uh, who we are new to. We're delighted that you're here and hope to be able to get to know you a little bit um, over the coming uh, hour and a half and indeed over the coming kind of weeks and months. My name is Jacob Reynolds. I'm the head of policy here at MCC Brussels uh, and we uh, tonight and uh, through all of our work, want to really open up discussion about some of the major issues that are facing uh, the EU and indeed facing uh, Europe. And so to that end, we're hosting regular events and discussions as well as producing research and policy papers on what uh, are some of the major challenges uh, facing us all who have a stake in the future of Europe, such as uh, obviously this issue uh, that we have this evening, um, where we'll be looking at this topic, the rule of law. For those of you, um, I remember when I studied political science, the rule of law was a very kind of minor and small detail that people noted as an important part of a legal system, whereas now you can barely uh, open up uh, a newspaper that's talking about EU issues without almost every issue being considered a kind of a rule of law issue. Um, it, rule of law violations are one of the major kind of topics of news. Uh, in Europe, and they seem to merit the most severe punishments that the EU is capable of. But many people think that this issue uh, has become deeply politicized. Um, it's no longer just about, for example, the functioning of legal systems or judges, but even extends to issues of how uh, education systems operate in EU countries. So many people think this issue has become terribly politicized. Um, and But others of course, insist that stopping a so-called drift into authoritarianism should be the kind of major focus of EU institutions and enforcing uh, rule of law norms is the kind of major way to stop this. Um, those of you who've been following uh, events uh, in France will, might notice that there's some degree of selective enforcement about uh, the concept of rule of law or so people might claim that you can have kind of legislative instruments used in what might be a undemocratic manner that merit no attention but uh, as soon as uh, other things happen in countries that are kind of less favorable then you hear uh, the kind of cry of rule of law issues all of that is a way of saying we have uh, an awful lot to dig into this evening and i'm very grateful for our three panelists because they really will help us to kind of navigate our way through this i'll introduce you to you briefly in the order that they'll uh, speak and then we'll get into the meat of this discussion which i should say as with all mcc brussels discussions aims to be a public discussion aims to be a place where we can amongst ourselves really have out some of these key issues and we don't want it to just be a academic or intellectual exercise but also a public and political and democratic exercise in getting to grips with these important issues so our panel First, you'll hear from uh, Akos Benzagat, who's the head of communications and foreign affairs at the Danube Institute, and most importantly for our discussion tonight, is the author, as you can see over there, of a, a really perhaps maybe the most important book on this topic at the moment, The European Policy on the Rule of the Law, Glimpse Behind the Scenes. Uh, uh, this book really lays out and goes into some detail about how the rule of law discussions operate. And so we're really grateful that uh, Benson's here to give us a extended kind of, or a little preview of the book, which I hope you all will be able to pick up and, uh, and dig into in a bit more detail. Speaking after that is Gladden Papin, who's Associate Professor at the University of Dallas and Senior Visiting Fellow at the MCC uh, in Hungary. We're really delighted to have uh, Gladden over, who's been a commentator not just on these issues, but also on wider issues related to uh, EU enlargement and uh, issues associated with how the EU functions in kind of the cultural life of uh, member states. We're really delighted that Gladden's with us. And then last, but of course, no means least, is Dr. Ashley Frawley, who's a Visiting Research Fellow for us at MCC. See Brussels. Ashley's an author of a variety of books, and perhaps most importantly for us this evening, is a commentator, uh, writer on a huge range of topics related to cultural issues uh, that play very strongly uh, in this issue. So, we're really delighted to have Ashley. Can we welcome our panel. So, without any further ado, uh, Benza, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, is it working? Yes. 
but anyway, we are in a small room, so that <laughs> we can hear each other. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for this nice introduction and uh, for hosting this event, uh, uh, which led to discussion also on my work, uh, on my book, uh, why we should speak about the rule of law. Uh, uh, you know well that uh, the EU funds, cohesion funds uh, that Hungary is uh, entitled to are uh, partially suspended uh, nowadays and there are ongoing negotiations on that. Then there is uh, the recovery fund, the COVID-19 uh, recovery fund, which is uh, uh, still not disbursed to Poland and Hungary. Uh, if we go to other countries, uh, we witness the... Um, a EP delegation, a mission to Greece recently, some weeks ago, where the EP's delegation found just some weeks uh, before uh, the general elections in Greece uh, that they, there are serious concerns uh, of, of the rule of law in Greece as well. And uh, today the Council of the Ministers had a discussion on the rule of law situation in five member states. So this is a topic, uh, a very hot topic uh, in Brussels. Uh, and the question is, uh, how did we get there? Because if we have some uh, uh, historical background, we can know that this is kind of a recent picture, even if it dates back to the early 2010s. Uh, and my aim in the book uh, is, to, is to prove that uh, a European policy on the rule of law uh, has been constructed uh, during the last decade, since the early 2010s. Uh, and uh, we should have discussion on this uh, policy on the rule of law because if someone says policy, uh, we say also political interest, economical interest, lobby interest, party political interest behind, and we should discuss about this question. Uh, however, what we see is that uh, the rule of law became a kind of a sacred cow in the European Union. No one can question uh, the EU's rule of law policy. Uh, and uh, what does the science do? Uh, there are a lot of scientific or expert uh, research papers on the rule of law, but uh, 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 very few of them are critical. And uh, if they are critical, they are only critical towards the EU institutions because they say that they do not go far enough in putting pressure on the member states. But uh, there is practically no one or a very few space like uh, MCC, and I uh, read the recent report of the MCC and find it very interesting, uh, where we question also this, uh, this policy of the mainstream and this policy of EU institutions. Um, I think that we should ask questions such as, uh, is this, uh, are the rule of law instruments uh, constructed in the EU efficient? Uh, uh, are they useful for the European cooperation or are they harmful? Uh, are they used neutrally or not? Uh, what, are the, what are the interests behind, the lobby behind? Uh, and that is what I, I, I try to, to trace back uh, in, in my book, uh, which is basically based on my master thesis uh, at the uh, French Public School of Administration, ENA, and uh, Ponton Sorbonne University. I tell this because this is important for an international public that this work, uh, the major part of this work, went through a scrutiny uh, by uh, a very renowned uh, um, university in France, uh, so that this has a uh, scientific value as well. So I know that I have only a few times, maybe six minutes left, and I will uh, really uh, strictly attach to this time limit. And I just want to share some uh, some findings which uh, may be, uh, which are forgotten or not well known uh, nowadays. So uh, first of all, uh, Mm, I think that uh, no one really remembers that in 2013 there was a letter by, by three foreign ministers addressed to the head of the European Commission, to the Commissioner, uh, to the head, to President Barroso. Uh, these were uh, Germany, Denmark, uh, Finland and the Netherlands. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, this uh, foreign minister was Franz Timmermans, who is now well known in Brussels because he is vice president of the Commission. Uh, and uh, in charge was in charge in the, of the rule uh, of the rule of law policy uh, until the last term, uh, and in 2013 already these ministers wrote uh, uh, in their letter that a mechanism of the rule of law should be put in place in the EU, and uh, that uh, mechanism should uh, let at the end uh, 
should uh, should give the uh, give the possibility to suspend EU funding for the member states, so that uh, ten, le ten years later we are here, but already ten years ago they wrote about this uh, in official documents. And in 2014, the next or the very first uh, important institutional step happened in the European Union when the European Commission put in place the so-called rule of law framework. Uh, and this rule of law framework, uh, the communication, the official communication that the Commission is issued on it, uh, uh, precised that uh, uh, the Commission needs a tool that can deal with uh, cases outside EU law. And I think that that arises a question because uh, um, because how is it normal that an EU institution wants to act, act uh, um, outside uh, European uh, competences? At least this is a question. And this was a question back then. And uh, there was an answer by the Council and especially the legal service of the Council, which in an official legal opinion, which can be found, still found on the internet, but I also safeguarded on my PC to be sure. Uh, uh, it, 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 it is written, so the legal service argued that there is no legal basis uh, for the Commission uh, to control the situation of the rule of law in the member states. And lack of legal basis, that means illegal, that means it is against the rule of law of the European Union, the rules of the Re European Union. Uh, with the parenthesis that, of course, Article 7 is the only uh, procedure that uh, that lets the EU to 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 make a kind of scrutiny, but uh, the rule of law framework of the Commission uh, uh, was found uh, very uh, initially very uh, very illegal, uh, and the Council, by the way, replied uh, to the Commission uh, by putting in place the so-called rule of law dialogue. Uh, and this rule of law dialogue was at the beginning uh, an instrument of the co the council to say uh, we are dealing with this rule of law question which is we understand it is important for some political forces and uh, there is a pressure uh, on, in media for this so the council deals with it but it was an instrument which very much respected uh, the sovereignty of the member states nowadays this uh, um, this rule of law dialogue changed as, changed as well and as today they held uh, they had the rule of law dialogue, they are going more deeply inside uh, in a country's rule of law question, but back then this was different. And in 2016, another date, uh, the European Parliament pushed forward uh, to an annual rule of law scrutiny of all member states. But since the European Parliament does not have the uh, the authority or the, the competence for a, a legislative initiative in the European Union, in order to establish such a mechanism, it needed uh, the, the support of the European Commission. But the European Commission, early in January 2017, replied uh, uh, the Parliament that the annual rule of law monitoring mechanism proposed by the Parliament was, uh, uh, was problematic. It raised uh, serious concerns in terms of legality and in terms of necessity of such an instrument. It was in 2017. Two years later, however, in 2019, the Commission came out with the idea of an annual rule of law monitoring mechanism, which is called the rule of law, annual rule of law report. Uh, and uh, by the way, an interesting element of context is that it was uh, first vice president of the commission, uh, Franz Timmermans, who announced the, the, uh, the necessity of such an instrument and, the, and that they will put in place such an instrument uh, in the middle of the European parliamentary election campaign, uh, where he was a lead candidate for the socialist, by the way. So just to, to give you some impressions on uh, how much uh, political interest is uh, uh, influencing uh, the rule of law instruments in the European Union. And then we arrive uh, in 2018 uh, uh, and 2020 to the so-called conditionality mechanism, and that will be my last point. But uh, this is the hottest topic nowadays because this conditionality mechanism and regulation uh, is the one uh, through which uh, uh, fun EU funding is suspended uh, uh, in the case of Hungary. Uh, you have to know that in the case of the conditionality regulation, uh, the original draft of the European Commission uh, made clear that this was a kind of initiative to 
complement the existing rule of law tools in the European Union with uh, another tool which uh, um, which let the European institutions put financial pressure on the member states as well if they find that there is a rule of law shortcoming. So this was a kind of financial pressuring tool uh, and this was meant to be such a tool. But of course there was negotiation with the council and finally this uh, this uh, purpose uh, kind of disappeared from the text and uh, they replaced it with the protection of the budget. It was important because otherwise it would have been illegal. Uh, this conditionality regulation, you know it was adapted at the end of 2020, uh, was challenged by Hungary and Poland before the Court of Justice of the European Union. And uh, the Advocate General of the European Court of Justice, who prepares a legal opinion before uh, the court decides, uh, uh, specified uh, these two possible way of in ways of interpretation of the conditionality regulation and said, wrote, that uh, if uh, the conditionality regulation is a uh, is a kind of uh, financial sanctioning tool of other rule of law mechanisms, uh, then it is illegal. So if it serves to uh, put financial pressure on member states where they think that there is a, a rule of law shortcoming, then it is illegal. But if option B, if this is a tool for protecting the EU's budget, it is legal. Uh, and the Court of Justice only dealt with the second option, didn't even mention the first option, but argued for the second option. And uh, the Court of Justice found that, okay, the conditionality regulation is legal because it is a, a budget protection tool, uh, which is uh, outstanding, I think, that all this happened uh, in, a, in a media context, in a political context, and everyone knew that... Uh, the purpose of this tool is to put financial pressure on member states and they even I think that maybe not uh, children in kindergarten but uh, at high school already they could have uh, uh, point out the two member states uh, who which were uh, in the target of this uh, instrument uh, instrument Poland and Hungary uh, and even politicians, institutional leaders said, finally, we, are, we, have, we have and we will have in practice a, a financial pressure uh, tool uh, against Hungary and Poland. But uh, in the court, uh, in the courtroom, uh, the argument was more elegant. This is a budget protection tool. And please uh, forget about all these uh, uh, claims that it, 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 it has other purpose. And finally, the court uh, validated this uh, rule of law conditionality tool. And now I'm coming uh, to the conclusion remark is that we see now how it works in practice. We have the conditionality tool. S Hungary, Hungary's EU funding is suspended. Uh, still negotiations ongoing on this issue. Uh, we have a procedural framework, but no one really knows what happens because it's very unclear. Uh, at the same time, there is also another negotiation for the recovery fund. The recovery fund is not paid neither, so de facto it is suspended, but it is not under the conditionality regulation, which means what is the purpose of, of the existence of the conditionality regulation if we can also suspend uh, EU funding without uh, uh, entering into this conditionality regulation. And the second thing is that uh, no one knows how these two negotiations relate to each other. I, don't, I think that neither the Commission nor Hungary, Hungarian government, I'm not sure, of course, but uh, I see that this is completely not transparent. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, phenomenon where uh, Hungary wants to make a step forward in one procedure, uh, and they say in the Commission, you cannot go further until in the other procedure you make a step further. Then they go to the other room, to the other negotiators, to the other procedure. They say, OK, here we would like to make a step forward. And they say, sorry, you cannot go further until in the other procedure uh, you, cannot, you don't go further. Uh, and, and I think that this is a completely arbitrary, to tell the truth. Uh, and we are, uh, and this is my concluding remark, uh, is that uh, I think that we are coming back to a kind of prehistoric time, uh, at least legally, uh, where public authorities, and now I am talking about European public authorities, um, can change procedures and even ongoing procedure rules uh, because they are in a position of dominance, in a position of power, and uh, there is no legal constraint on it. 
This is totally a political decision. I think this is an issue. I think that science uh, and scientists and experts should talk about this. And even independently from the fact whether they think that a rule of law criticism against Hungary and Poland is founded or not. I think this is an issue for everyone because this is about uh, the very rule of law of the European Union. No, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. The subtitle of your book is a glimpse uh, kind of behind the, the, the curtain, a glimpse into how this really operates. And I think you gave us a kind of good glimpse of that there. And we'll have plenty of time to go a little uh, deeper and pick up some more issues uh, in, in a few moments. But uh, Gladden, some thoughts from you. Uh, first of all, thank you to MCC Brussels for, well, existing, first of all. That's a, quite an accomplishment. Um, and thanks for inviting me here. And congratulations, Bensa, on a very outstanding book, uh, which I read uh, closely um, and uh, learned a great deal from. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm going to offer a few perspectives from the United States, even though I'm not living there at the moment, but I'm following very closely what's going on. So, um, I, if President Trump is arrested in the next hour and a half, it'll be a, a great irony um, and maybe something worth commenting on. So unfortunately, I've had to turn my phone off at the moment. So if you could just let me know. Um, but uh, again, I, I don't want to get into the details of that case. But um, you know, the the charges for which he or the potential charges for which he's being reviewed by the local prosecutor in Manhattan are um, claims uh, of a failure to disclose. Um, campaign finance related financial transfers. I'll leave out the details of that case. Um, and these were already reviewed by the Federal Election Commission and, and thrown out. So this is uh, about a local uh, local prosecutor, again, um, sort of draping himself in the, in the rule of law and potentially uh, we'll see what happens out of that. Um, so I can't help but think of things like that that are, that are happening in, in the United States at the moment. Um, and I remembered two other things. One happened a few years ago, and um, these came to mind as I was I spent the day reading some of the EU's 2022 rule of law reports in order to get an uh, appreciation of what they're interested in. Um, and I remembered a story from the uh, Obama administration uh, concerning the Internal Revenue Service and the IRS. And there was quite a scandal that's maybe been forgotten now uh, nonprofit organizations, of course, apply to the IRS for their uh, tax exempt status. And the IRS under the Obama administration, this is widely reported. I found a, it hasn't been deleted yet. I found a 2013 report from the Washington Post, which is not a, obviously a, a right wing publication, uh, noting that these uh, officials at the IRS were putting in a lot of additional pressure on conservative groups. Um, regarding their qualifications, so putting pressure on them to reveal the identity of their donors, which is not something that you have to do. Um, and apparently officials uh, in the Washington office, as well as Cincinnati and a couple of offices in California, all engaged in this activity. Basically, they were, they had, they were under some kind of pressure to put conservative organizations through the ringer um, at the IRS. And I remember this at the time, and uh, hasn't been hasn't been mentioned lately, but uh, one of the sections in each of the rule of law reports uh, from the European Union concerns the treatment of NGOs. Um, and it seems like most of the way the the EU looks at this is whether is 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 whether regulations are being applied to NGOs adversely for political reasons. Um, although they although there are also some substantive. Um, it's, it's clear that they have some substantive concerns behind the application of that, um, such as particularly they investigate how LGBT, uh, pro-LGBT organizations are treated. They do not seem to investigate how conservative organizations are treated. Um, and that reminded me of this larger scandal uh, at the IRS, which actually a, a, at the time did a lot within the country um, to dent the credibility of those supposedly impartial administrative organizations. Unfortunately, I think American politics has become considerably more cynical um, about that in the, in the last few years. I'll make a couple more comments about that. Um, and then a couple of months ago, there was a leaked, maybe just a month ago, a leaked memorandum, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from the Richmond, Virginia office uh, of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in which they assessed, 
This is one of the new words that's used constantly. Uh, it's a pseudo administrative word um, that usually packs some deep substance behind it. They assessed um, that there was a significant terrorist threat uh, warranting um, remedial measures or active measures or something like that, all this um, administrative speak, um, from traditionalist Catholic groups. Um, so, you know, sometimes traditionalist Catholics are said to be little old ladies, and other times they're said to be uh, that no young people are interested, and other times it's said to be potential terrorist groups. Um, it's actually the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops um, uh, objected to that. Now, one typical response from the right is to say that this is a matter of hypocrisy, that when we look at um, things that are going on in France or um, these cases that I mentioned in the United States, that it's a matter of hypocrisy. And my um, friend, Professor Adrian Vermeule uh, at Harvard Law School is fond of saying, it's not hypocrisy, it's hierarchy. I think this was a point you mentioned at the end there, um, that really, the, the, that obviously that doesn't explain the entire phenomenon, um, but that there is a, an, an element of hierarchy and, and rank here. You know, uh, and it's the, the ranking is draped in some neutral language, but uh, the ranking and the idea of um, hierarchy has gotten more and more uh, intense. And um, I, I, I began to think of a debate, how different the debates were 20 years ago. Um, I was in college and, and graduate school at the time, and the, the discussion in the political science department uh, on European issues at, at, at Harvard was, is there a democratic deficit in the European Union institutions? Um, and it struck me, thinking back on that debate, which was the one of the main, again, from my perspective at the time, exclusively in the US, one of the main uh, discussion points at the time, is there a democratic deficit uh, underlying the major European Union institutions? And the primary response, the uh, I guess, intellectual agenda setting response came from uh, Andrew Moravchik um, at Harvard University uh, in defense of the democratic deficit is what he called it. Um, and I looked at his article today and um, just to compare it to the, the current debate, and I was struck by two things. Uh, first of all, he says, well, uh, we don't really, we don't, if there is a democratic deficit, we don't really need to worry about it because the things that the European Union concerns itself with are things that are typically uh, delegated away from popular sovereignty in national institutions. He lists uh, central banking, uh, constitutional adjudication, civil protection, economic diplomacy, and technical administration. So his argument for not worrying too much was that it's kind of like banking and a little bit, some little administrative things here and there. Um, and then he said, but, and if we do need to be concerned, again, we don't have to worry too much because the way that the uh, European Commission approaches most of these issues is through pressure from the European Parliament. And that's the democratic institution, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, but it really struck me how much the, um, the, the, the EU's emphasis on rule of law has taken that debate and, and turned it around. Uh, again, this is just an observation. Um, I'm merely observing the disappearance of discussion over the democratic deficit, which was uh, a big point of discussion among, again, at least political science, political theory world uh, discussions 20 years ago. I think one element of that uh, as well is a kind of, uh, again, ironically, a kind of decline in um, faith in democracy within the European Union. I know that uh, part of the discussions uh, this week concern reviewing the rule of law reports in Slovakia, and so I was doing a little bit of poking around uh, to see where the, where the discourse is uh, on Slovakia, as they say, and I found a report from uh, the Atlantic Council, its new Atlanticist blog, uh, in December, and the headline was uh, Slovakia risks becoming another Hungary-style EU spoiler, how should the West respond? Um, and it's the, what struck me about this article is that it's, a, it's, it's an article about electoral politics. It's like, well, 
there might be a right-wing coalition government at some point soon. And if there is, we know, ipso facto, um, that rule of law will suffer. And I just think that's a really interesting um, dynamic of, uh, of the argument, that it's, it's not, um, you know, well, we, we, won't, um, we won't make any preliminary judgments, but if things take a wrong turn, you know, we'll, uh, we'll swoop in. Instead, it's, well, you know, if the wrong side wins, the rule of law is, is over. Um, and I would just conclude on the point, we can talk more about it later, um, then in fact, I, I, I think Benz is completely right um, in his main point that's made at the beginning of the book to, to view this as a policy. I think that's a very intelligent way of putting it, very accurate. Um, at the same time, um, it, it would be sad if we lost the some concept of the rule of law entirely, um, and we shouldn't be totally cynical about it. Obviously, there are things that are internal to law, such as you know, procedures for presenting someone with charges. You know, there are all sorts of internal aspects of, of private law. Um, but now it's, it seems, if I had to put it in a sentence, it seems that um, they're, they're trying to use some narrow conception um, arising uh, in order to trump uh, elements of public law that are not just generalizable rules, but can legitimately vary from, from country to country. Yeah, the, thanks a lot, Glenn. And we definitely want to get to the kind of other side of the, the case. As you say, if, if there's a positive case for the rule of law as a concept, you wouldn't want to jettison it, of course. Um, and thanks also for your remarks on the kind of disappearance of the debate about the democratic deficit. I mean, those of us who lived through the period of Brexit or Trump or the Gilets jaunes know that people became much more concerned about a kind of def democratic surplus. There was too much democracy, too okay. much politics going on rather than a democratic uh, deficit. But uh, Ashley, some thoughts from you. Right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your contributions and also for your very clear book. I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's very clarifying um, and unusual for this kind of uh, work um, in political sociology to be so clear and so clarifying. Um, so I work on issues related to gender, uh, parenting, families and family policy more generally. So um, I, I kind of wanted to speak to a few of the ways in which this figures in um, some of these uh, case studies or examples that have come up in my own research. Um, and for me, um, what's interesting is the way that the rule of law becomes a medium through which fundamental and, and deeply controversial debates become translated into technical questions, legal questions, questions that you can sort of appoint a a group of experts uh, as though you can sort of consult the oracles and everything will be fine. But these are deeply social, historical, and cultural questions. Um, and that's not really the place for technical expertise. And yet increasingly, that is how we are led to, to think about issues of, of even social policy. But as I explained to my students, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I put up a slide in some of my lectures with a thermometer on it. We can be most certain about questions of the physical sciences, right? so the thermometer is very hot <laughs> in terms of certainty, and slightly less certain about questions of the biological sciences, and least certain about questions of the social sciences. That seems quite obvious to me uh, as a sociologist. Um, and yet when you turn to um, social questions, questions of social policy, even family policy, you see this desire to transform what are deeply contentious issues, issues about values, morality, tradition, history, economics, culture, as though this is something that science can answer. And there's a strong desire to construct a consensus, a consensus around the world. So there's a global consensus about X. That's shocking to me as a sociologist, particularly as a cultural sociologist with a background in anthropology, that something related to the family, which is extraordinarily um, heterogeneous, around the world, very different in different places and historically, that there should be a global consensus on some questions regarding how children should be raised, um, how families should be formed. These are going to create tensions within countries, between countries. And yet there's a tendency to, um, to act as though they can be uh, uh, answered outside of the, the light of public debate, as though you can simply um, decide these by uh, an expert group. Um, so 
Um, in MCC's recent report, Dangerous Game, the Weaponization of the Rule of Law and the Attack on Libido, um, they bring up the concept of legalism, which I think is really useful and helpful to understand some of, some of these issues. Um, so, uh, uh, so contentious issues, when they are transformed into legal questions or sometimes technical questions, um, are able to uh, or have a way of um, removing any of the morality, any of the, the contention, any of the uh, debate or the, the discord. Um, so a good example of this is the recent proposal for a European Certificate of Parenthood, which would require uh, member states to acknowledge the rights of same-sex parents that have been granted in another EU country. Uh, the certificate would be obtainable in the country where the initial family links were established, and each member state would be obliged to accept it. Um, and this proposal has been lauded for allowing rainbow families or LGBT families um, to cross borders more easily. Um, and the Commissioner for Justice, uh, EU Commissioner for Justice, stressed in December that this would in no way interfere with the national law uh, and what each country recognizes as a family. And yet it would oblige each country to recognize <laughs> as a family um, those that have family links elsewhere. So it's a very sort of underhanded kind of measure. And this is not at all surprising. Um, and if you kind of dig into it, you see that a confluence of interests and forces have led to this, to a proposal that appears to have come out of nowhere. And the more that you look into it, the more that you see that, like, what constitutes a family <laughs> is such a contentious issue. Uh, it's, it's subject to a huge amount of debate now, particularly within countries. And yet, over the past decade, um, this has been uh, delegated to a group of experts um, who were largely legal experts. And, you know, if you look through the EU documentation on this and the discussion about this, there was, you know, oh, well, don't worry, we've got a, a, a team of experts from all over the world who are legal experts, as though this is something that can be decided there. Um, and so these deeper questions get transformed into legal questions. And then, of course, they get transformed into technical questions, because, of course, I feel like if you scratch below the surface of an illiberal um, family policy or an undemocratic family policy, you always find UNICEF. Um, <laughs> and so if you sort of scratch below the surface, you can see UNICEF obviously has uh, an interest and uh, a sort of campaign around um, birth registration and registra registration of vital statistics. This is a technical question. Um, and uh, so the European Certificate of Parenthood came, comes out of this sort of confluence of UNICEF trying to ensure that all countries around the world are registering their, their vital events. But how do they define, a decade ago, what is a vital event? Recognition of parenthood. Just sort of slipped into the definition of what is a vital event that countries should be recognizing and certifying. And this very, this very sort of handily and quietly circumvents questions about parentage by t talking about parenthood, um, recognition of parenthood. Um, and so but countries that want to, of course, keep up with a very basic thing, which is uh, having a very large proportion of your population registering their vital events are then vulnerable to falling behind if they raise these questions about, hold on a second, how do we recognize parentage in our country? If they start to raise these questions and they don't certify these things and you have people who lack this certification, then they risk falling behind. And then this technical question is used to pressure countries to, to adopt these, these kinds of policies. Um, and just one further example of this, um, uh, of this tendency to use um, the rule of law, to use legalism and to use uh, expertise to circumvent democratic debate. Um, uh, what will happen is um, global groups, like the Global Initiative. So one of these, um, one, another sort of case study that I've looked at is um, the campaign to ban corporal punishment in the home. So that is, you know, obviously you will not be surprised to learn that most countries uh, ban beating children, <laughs> including European countries. Um, but there is a global initiative um, to end all corporal punishment of children, um, which wants all corporal punishment, including light smacks, 
on the back of the legs or the back of the hand or whatever, um, or spanking as Americans call it, um, illegal and banned in the home. Um, and to make no distinction between that and assault and beating a child. Um, and now most people don't agree with this. Um, and in most, you know, just most countries, polls show that most people think that it is necessary sometimes to give a child a light smack for the purposes of discipline. So democracy then is a small impediment for people who um, used EU law to bypass this um, and to reinterpret um, a 1960s charter mandating protection of children from negligence, violence, and exploitation to also include mild discipline uh, deemed reasonable in most countries. Uh, and I bring up this example because, so this was used then to pressure EU countries to ban corporal punishment in the home when the people in those countries never debated it and often weren't aware of it. Um, and then to use that to create this list of all of these countries. Look, you wanna be in line with these countries, right? Um, and so you want to adopt this policy. Uh, and so they took this to the UK where there was actually an open debate. And this brings up also some of the arbitrariness that you were talking about. And, and the fact that the sort of uh, railroading over the rule of law doesn't really matter when it's around an issue that, you, that the EU cares about. So when there was a debate in Wales about whether or not they should ban corporal punishment of children, Welsh legislators were actually promising arbitrary enforcement of the law. <laughs> when people were saying, so wait, hold on, if I smack the back of my child's hand, does that mean that I'm, I could go to jail? And they were like, sometimes my, it might, sometimes it might not. <laughs> when? <laughs> I mean, this, this is supposed to be an aspect of the rule of law. Prohibition, at least to the, I know it's obviously subject to a lot of debate, but it, you know, prohibition of arbitrariness is supposed to be a key aspect of the rule of law. And yet here we had the EU being used to pressure countries to adopt what is actually advertised as an arbitrary application of the law. And that was just fine. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks, Ashley. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the, the MCC Brussels report, which people can find on, on our website. I do urge you to go and read that in addition to Akos's book. I want to come out for questions, but I want to just pick up a couple of uh, quick things first. I mean, Akos, I think it'd be hard to, uh, to, if you were to sit down with kind of one of the proponents of the rule of law mechanisms or of using rule of law language to kind of enforce discipline on hunger opponents, it'd be hard for, to get them to read your book and have a kind of uh, it, but it, they, if you were, I think one of the things people might accept is that, yes, at times throughout European history, the history of the EU, the legal frameworks used to kind of give effect to some of the tasks that the EU has set itself have often been shaky. They've been difficult. But that's because the EU is adapting to an evolving environment for which it was not created. And it's always trying to adapt its tools to the tools of the time. And people would say, I guess, that um, the EU was not created on the assumption that there would be countries within the EU that would find themselves in kind of authoritarian um, regimes, as they would, would put it. And so, I mean, at, at some level, it's hard to engage in this without picking up the substance of whether there are genuine kind of democratic rule of law issues in these member states. But I wonder if you have a kind of response to this, that some degree of evolution of the legal framework is kind of necessary to grapple with the changing environment. Because I think that'd be one of the things that maybe your critics might put to you. Thank you very much. Uh, just your first, uh, first remark was that, uh, is it possible to give my book to people who do not uh, agree with us. Yes, it is. We, we did so ju just this afternoon with uh, uh, Tony and it worked well. Um, uh, the person we met with uh, said at the beginning that she doesn't agree with anything uh, she thinks, but uh, then we had a very interesting discussion for two hours and I think that we will continue. Uh, and I think that we have, have to do this job and we of course have to listen to the others as well. Uh, so, so I, I am positive on this, uh, even if uh, reading only Twitter of uh, politicians uh, can, <coughs> can differ uh, our mentality. Uh, the, the other thing is that the EU, EU is changing and there is an evolution, that's normal, but uh, in this case uh, they should uh, change regulation, they should change the treaties. 
uh, they should make a discussion and uh, they should make the evolution together. Uh, and the, my problem is that uh, um, they, will, they want to change the EU uh, without changing the treaties because they know that they no, do not have the uh, sufficient majority for this unanimity, the so-called unanimity. Uh, and this is problematic because uh, to get another example, if you go to Hungary, uh, criticisms say that uh, in Hungary, um, for example, the opposition doesn't agree with the change of the constitution. Uh, they think that this is not a, not a good policy, uh, any, any, any kind of change of constitution. But still, there is a change of constitution because there is a majority to change the constitution, so it's legal, it can be changed. Uh, so that the Hungarian government and the Hungarian majority proceeds through a legal procedure, respects the rule of law. In the European Union, the evolution of the EU is uh, not every time respecting the rule of law and the current treaties. Uh, and I think that this goes back to, uh, to the fact that the EU is a is an international organization or very much influenced by a uh, kind of, uh, how to say, international law way of functioning. That means that in international law, of course, we have the law, but we have also the political strengths of the states as well, the political, economic and military strengths of the states. And this has an influence. Uh, and, um, and law is there in order to put regulation in this, but still we know that uh, we have lions and we have uh, smaller, smaller animals. And uh, um, in, the, in the European Union, what we can witness is that uh, the current uh, legal framework of the European Union is not sufficiently established and sufficiently strong uh, in order to uh, stop this kind of uh, uh, political voluntarism or political pressure. So that uh, uh, even if Hungary or Poland are criticized uh, in the field of the rule of law, I think that they are stronger on the field of the rule of law because uh, uh, the law, for example, in Hungary, which has a thousand year uh, constitutional tradition, uh, the law has much res much more respect uh, than in the European Union where we are used to doing deals and uh, doing policies and uh, not touching to the treaties if possible. No, the, thanks, uh, Akos. That actually brings us me on, uh, glad and something I wanted you to touch on a bit because uh, Ben said mentioned there that the European Union is made up of unequal states and they don't necessarily all have the kind of same power when it comes to forming these policies. You talked about how in reality these issues are ones of hierarchy um, rather than mm -hmm. hypocrisy and we should see it kind of built into the framework of the European institutions, this kind of selective treatment of certain countries, if you like. And I wanted you to expand on that a little bit because, um, I mean, one way you could look at it is that, yeah, it's the hierarchy of nations are big powerful ones like Germany or France are gonna set the agenda um, and they force the smaller states to kind of bend to their will. But my experience at least of the, and especially being here in, in the EU is that that's kind of less, I mean, that captures some elements of it, but there's another element to the real hierarchy at the heart of the, the European Union that gives rise to the selective enforcement. I wonder if you could just touch on like what is that hierarchy? Is it is not hierarchy just of nations? Is it hierarchy of cultural attitudes? Hierarchy of kind of class? What is that hierarchy? Yeah. No. I uh, no. I did not mean to say that it was a, a simple hierarchy of larger powers. And in, in fact, I was just trying to make an initial gesture at a different way of thinking it. I'm not attempting to describe what the hierarchy within the European uh, un Union looks like. Rather, it was, um, uh, yeah, just just a, a change of the way of thinking. And because, um, again, it, uh, conservatives in particular tend to respond to um, situations like that or like this by complaining about, uh, uh, complaining about hypocrisy. And I think it's actually the, um, the interesting questions are a little bit deeper. So I did, was not trying to make like a, a particular deep theory of how the European Union institutions um, institutions work. Um, so I don't have a good answer to your question since I wasn't intending to <laughs> uh, come up with theory, but I think it has something to do with what uh, Bensu was saying, not only from the perspective of uh, international law, but just you know the international communities that uh, rule makers are a part of. Um, these are powerful, the concepts that are being appealed to are ones that are very powerful in a democratic age. So in the United States, every political argument has to be made concerning equality, right? 
Um, but when the effort was made to change the law about marriage in the United States, that was also ultimately not made by a democratic process directly or legislative process, um, but by a, a judicial decision at the Supreme Court, Obergefell versus Hodges, kind of on the in the way that you were describing, there were some states that had changed their law and other states that hadn't, and so that was unfair if you're leaving the state and going to another state. Um, but uh, you know the the campaign slogan was simply an equal sign. You know, people just put an equal sign on the back of their car, um, and so it's just you know seems to be the the state of the modern world that uh, those those concepts more easily go one direction than than the other. It seems, um, but ultimately the uh, the selective enforcement is. Um, and the, the tilting of them in a particular direction is, a, is an expression of, of, a, of a type of power. Um, so I'll just leave it there for the yeah. time being. No, great, thanks. That was clarifying. Um, and actually, I wondered if you could just reflect briefly on, it was really good you mentioned this example of the certificate of, of parenthood, and maybe we can get into some of the details of that a bit more. But for me, it seemed that that struck a kind of, there's a close uh, parallel between the way that the EU might decide that in order to be recognized as a parent, you have to, there has to be a, a certificate issued, a particular process that's supervised by European institutions, presumably to go. And the way that nowadays, the, I mean, it would be assumed that unless the EU has certified you as a kind of rule of law compliant country, you don't get that presumption that you kind of have a decent legal system, even if occasionally maybe it needs to be investigated in certain areas. So I wondered if you could reflect on that fact that the the tendency here is it to kind of change these from assumptions within either communities or families or states to things that have to be validated by external authorities. Well, it would be a nice connection, except that it's um, entirely voluntary and only for. It, is your mic mic off? I'm just a tech problem. <laughs> Was it on? Yeah. Um, oh, now I can hear myself. Um, yeah, so it would be a nice connection, but of course it's entirely voluntary. And I think the um, the idea is that I'm not sure that it started out so explicitly um, as, a, as a tool to kind of beat certain countries into submission. I think this probably came about a bit later. Um, but it, it, you know, it's just a, a very good example of how you can have a highly contentious issue, like for example, surrogacy. You know, surrogacy, um, so part of the issue here is that you can wind up with stateless children, right? So if you have a surrogate in India and you have a birth certificate that recognizes the parentage of uh, an Indian mother, and that's how India recognize, puts things on a birth certi certificate, then you have a problem when you come back to the United States or to a European country um, in terms of, you know, adoption rights and so on. And so to make this smoother, the idea is you can have, it's not the only issue that's bound up with this, but you can have a, a certificate of parenthood that would allow for that to bypass these problems of different countries having different rules of what names you can put on a birth certificate. But now, now that sounds pretty unproblematic, but for example, surrogacy is really contentious and controversial. There are issues of things like exploitation, questions of inequalities between countries, um, and all of that kind of gets shunted outside, shunted out of the limelight, um, and it tr it's just transformed into a legal question of like, okay, how do we just make this mo run more smoothly? So I think that's the interesting thing for me, um, is the way that um, by transforming these questions into legal questions, what are deeply um, controversial problems are just kept outside of, of political debate. And of course, then it becomes, you know, once you have this agenda where you want certain countries to accept uh, apparently liberal values, like different kinds of families and so on, then once you have this instrument, it becomes this way of pushing other countries to adopt it and to bypass, um, you know, the principle of subsidiarity that c countries have uh, their own um, uh, jurisdiction over their family policy and how they recognize families, that gets bypassed. And so this idea that states should be left, that uh, how um, states recognize these things should be left up to states is gradually eroded through what are apparently simply legal and technical instruments.
Okay, great. Th thanks, uh, Ashley. I want to come out for some uh, questions. We can start with uh, Frank at the front, especially eager to hear uh, from people who, as I said, we have, we've so far not managed to touch on this issue, the substantive issue you might think of, whether, I mean, in certain EU member states, there are serious democratic or rule of law or legal issues that need that the EU as a political community needs to kind of grip, get to grips with. I'll be especially interested to hear from anyone who was genuinely kind of concerned about the situation in certain member states. But Frank, you can kick us off and then we'll go over here. Yeah, so from my research, I, I've drawn the conclusion that what's at stake is neither uh, not a hypocrisy nor hierarchy. Because I think what's, what is really critical here is often Right, this happens to me all the time, even on <laughs> TV programs. So um, I think the, the real issue at stake is this. The, uh, the oligarchy, the Eurocrats that run Europe are really aware of a very serious uh, democratic deficit, which used to be called a legitimacy crisis, where they lack the authority. There is no way that they can authorize decisions on an authoritative basis. And therefore, they're continually looking for ways and means uh, it, uh, or, or to which they, their, their authority can be given some kind of grounding in society and in existing culture. Now, if you look at the last 30 years particularly, because it's really in the 1970s that the legitimacy crisis really kicks in, they gradually are drawing the conclusion that, uh, obviously having read Max Weber on the law, that they draw the conclusion that the way you gain authority is by using legal instruments, which is why within the European Union there's an impulse to uh, essentially expand the law, both in terms of process and procedures, but also very importantly, expressivist law, where the laws you pass are sending out a message, you know, sort of to, to Europe. And what's very interesting is that in this attempt to create, use the law to legitimate their decisions, they've actually come to the point where they really believe what they're doing. So just to give you an idea, I, I was in DC uh, just before COVID, and we were involved in a, in a debate about these kinds of issues. And I, I made a throw of a remark about the importance of democracy. What, what's the point of talking about democratic deficit if you don't take democracy seriously? And this law professor from Madison, Wisconsin got up and was telling me that, Frank, what you don't realize is that the rule of law is logically prior to democracy. And when I said, well, you know, that's an interesting insight, but if coming from a democratic background and believing in popular and national sovereignty, I see the other way around. You can't really uh, take process as having a greater value than democratic decision making. I was the only person in the room I mean, I, I was literally the only person in the room to argue. Everybody else was completely fetishizing the rule of law as something that was a good in and of itself, as if somehow law by itself has got this kind of capacity. And Max Weber told us ages ago is that law lacks, lacks the moral depth, the moral depth to motivate, right? It, it, so it cannot legitimize within Europe itself, but what it can do is it can provide an, uh, an apparently neutral sounding instrument through which they can bypass politics. And I think that in that sense, what, what I think what has happened is that this select, what we see as a selective application of the rule of law is in their mind an entirely natural, normal way of being. Because we are, you know, we get it, they don't get it. We're aware, they're not aware. And when you look at their language, they really adopted this to the point at which they are not even aware of the fact that they are not only undemocratic, un un but they are using the law in the most tendentious, selective way imaginable. Just wondering what you guys thought about that. Thanks, Frank. I will take this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Renato Sobadini. I, uh, I used to be executive director of ILGA, the International Lesbian and Gay Association, Bisexual, Trans, Internet, all the letters of the alphabet soup. Uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of merit in the things that you said, uh, that you all said. Uh, I doubt, uh, well, maybe in contrast a little bit to what Frank just said, that surely the rule of law has value in itself. 
I, I'm not entirely sure we could imagine easily the exercise of a democratic society without the rule of law. It is true that there is always a component of it which is out of control of the current population, so to speak. Um, the ensemble of laws is the result of a selection process that lasted for millennia. So the idea that in dubio pro reo, so when uh, uh, you rather let, uh, have a, 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 a let go a guilty person rather than imprison a, a, an innocent one, etc. These are things that are at least 2,000 years, if not uh, older. At the same time, it is true that there is a political use of law. The, I, I think someone also called the term lawfare, okay, this uh, political use of, of law. And certainly the commission and the, and the people surrounding the commission are, 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 are indulging it in, in it a lot. It is also true that we find ourselves in a situation in which uh, uh, Europe, uh, unless there's going to be a major catastrophe, which we cannot uh, exclude, uh, both geopolitically or, let's say, uh, the, the advent of the next uh, artificial intelligence that finally takes over and liberates us all from our <laughs> troubles. But unless this happens, Europe is going to become more and more something of a hyperstate. Uh, and therefore, unless there is a really a process of political organization of those countries, uh, while they still have a little bit of power, I'm talking about the member states, that organize themselves in critical moments when it comes to selecting the president of the next uh, commission, etc. I, I doubt that you can see a, 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 an inversion of the tendency. Having said all this, concerning issue of the education and family, and let me say this, I don't think it helps when you have situations or cases like the, the Act 79 of 2021 of Hungary, where the, which is the, the law that uh, some people in the media call the anti-LGBTI law, and which is more a law about pedophilia and the measure against it. I don't think it does really help when the language, the wording of the law is so crass that it basically conflates child abuse and homosexuality, okay? Uh, probably the commission has now, because invited to do so by the European Parliament, uh, deferred uh, this law to the um, European Court of, uh, to the Court of Justice of the European Union on the basis of Article 2 of the treaty in relation to the respect of minorities they might have a chance, okay? And uh, uh, it, if the government of Hungary or the main political party had been smarter in relation to word, the wording, uh, probably they, they would have made a, a much more difficult job for the commission to intervene. Okay, thanks. No, that's good because it gets to some of the substantive issues that I wanted to get to about the substance of the rule of law uh, accusations, especially as they're made to say Hungary or Poland, but yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank all of the panelists. We have a really interesting discussion here today. Uh, I'm actually a former colleague of Ben Sabi. We used to work together at the Ministry of Justice. And I was just wondering about, um, I work at the European Parliament currently at the delegation of Fidesz. And we see in practice a lot of times that something I think has changed in the last couple of years. And uh, I'm, I would like to ask the panelists if, if Brexit, had any kind of effect on the, this game of lions, if we stick to the expression used by Bence, uh, because, well, we just had the anniversary of the Elysee Treaty uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I think that we know that there are some stronger member states which actually exert a lot of power, and uh, the balance of power has definitely changed according to my opinion when the British have left the EU. And uh, another thing about uh, the specific examples, uh, I would be really curious to see a situation where a central European country would decide to adopt a law, even if it's written in the constitution, without having a vote in the parliament, or adopting a new election law with a simple majority, 
or if we look at uh, an, a little bit of a different part of Europe, if we would have a country where for, for long months the selection of judges cannot be solved. For example, if we look at the, the example of Spain, where there were a lot of debates regarding the council selecting the judges. So my question is, if you look into the future, and I know that you do not have a looking glass, but is there any chance of change? You know, because the winds might change. And what happens then? Because if you accept that this is a policy on the rule of law, then if there are some power shifts in Europe, then some changes can happen in the future, right? So what happens then? What is the end game? Great, thanks. Is there anyone else who wants to come in at this time, especially as I say, this question of the, the substance or if anyone wants to kind of make a case for why it would be very important for the EU to have kind of strong measures to be able to take against countries that were uh, kind of not adhering to some basic kind of principles of democracy or the rule of law. If there's not, we can come back out in a second. So, uh, Benzo, do you want to reflect on a couple of quick points? Thank you very much. Uh, is it working now? Yes. Like okay. Thank you. So, so the question of uh, the democracy, uh, democratic deficit that uh, Frank mentioned, I think that it is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. That uh, also, when I was at uh, university in 2008, 2013, uh, we were talking about the democracy deficit of the EU. But I have the impression that this is a uh, this this is kind of disappeared from the public discussion because now we have the rule of law issue. Uh, it is kind of overwritten. So if there was a, a democratic or constitutional problem in the European Union uh, that used to be the democratic deficit of the EU, now this is the rule of law issue and this is about the member states, not about the EU. And I think, of course, it is not that simple that, uh, th uh, but I would say that there is a, uh, there is a kind of... Uh, um, tendency to overwrite uh, this uh, democratic or human rights deficit of the EU by uh, by uh, putting uh, the reflectors, or I had to say, putting the light on the member states. Uh, then uh, there was a point on uh, the relation between uh, r the rule of law and democracy, uh, and I think that uh, uh, French professor Bertrand Mathieu made it quite well. Then he explained that these concepts are first of all not synonym synonym. So they are uh, two different concepts, but two important concepts nowadays. So that democracy is the rule of the majority, but if, of course, the majority can not do everything, of course, there should be some limits. So the liberal principle is, is limiting democracy. Uh, but he argues, and I, I completely agree with this, that uh, if uh, liberalism is uh, too strong or there is too much dose of liberalism, in this uh, um, duo of liberalism and uh, democracy, then democracy cannot prevail. So that we should find a kind of uh, balance. And we cannot say that uh, we could do a good society only with the rule of law and let's forget about uh, democracy. Uh, the rule of law, of course, has a value. I think this is a constitutional value. And if you look at the treaties uh, um, and the history of the treaties, uh, the wording of Article 2 used to be uh, uh, the European Union or the European community also shares the values common to the member states. Now it is changed and it is written that uh, uh, the EU has its own values, uh, uh, which are by the way common to the member states. But these values are originating from the member states. These values are, the rule of law is also originating from Hungary and Hungary's uh, a thousand year old constitutional uh, uh, legacy. Uh, regarding uh, Brexit, uh, I think uh, this is a, a very uh, good remark because uh, with the Brexit, uh, uh, those who are advocating for a more federal Europe uh, has a power position and this was not the case uh, before and uh, I think that uh, there is a change in uh, the way of doing politics in Brussels and there is uh, much more use of power, political, economic power and uh, uh, it, it has become more aggressive. Sorry to say that, uh, and this is also due to the Brexit that there is no uh, counter power uh, to the to the federalist forces. Uh, double standards, of course, we 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 know them uh, as well. Uh, la France, c'est la France. Uh, this this is uh, this comes this quote comes from uh, Jean Claude Juncker. Uh, change to change, yes, 
I think there is a chance. Uh, uh, no one knows what will happen in two weeks or there's a corruption scandal like the Cattergate that you can uh, shed light on some things that are not working in the EU and alternative are, are, are surged. And the LGBTQ law, I think, uh, uh, of course, this is a deeper debate, but uh, honestly, I read the, the law and uh, uh, the only thing I see is that, of course, this is in the same package of law that they are speaking about uh, uh, pedophilia, crime and uh, uh, sexual propaganda to, to children. But uh, I haven't uh, seen any uh, phrases where there is a kind of equality or a clear link between the two or a causality relation. Uh, I understand what you say and I understand the sensibility. Uh, but reading uh, the law, I don't have the feeling that uh, uh, the purpose of this law was to make a kind of confusion between the two but of course this can be a matter of debate but i think that uh, this is not the wording of the law but this is the framing the political and media framing of the law which made the debate and this is a bit different thank you okay good benson thanks and i'm glad you mentioned katargate as well because it gives me a nice uh, opportunity or excuse to mention our event next week and on next wednesday which you can find the full details of of our website where we'll be looking at the origins of katargate what the uh, scandal reveals about the eu i hope you can join us for that one as well um but glad and some thoughts oh okay uh yeah d d won't respond to to everything, but uh, it, 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 Spencer has has already done so. Um, but uh, again, no, 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 no. But uh, that that was really good. But I, I I've just been thinking of American parallels in my mind, um, and because there were a couple of things that happened in 2016, um, and they. I I I haven't I have I haven't said anything. <laughs> Um, but yeah, well, illusion, illusions were punctured on both sides of the Atlantic, we could say. Um, and since then, I think basically the uh, sort of liberal international institutions, if we can call them that, have been in a like a white knuckle mode where there's a there's a f there's a fear um, that uh, a fear and therefore a kind of instinctive recourse to other ways of exercising power, which I think uh, Frank was des describing well in the U.S. Again, it always happens on slightly different wavelength. It's now the diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements. So at universities, they have a mandate um, in part due to the way that federal regulations are written to pursue equ equity. Um, and this is, in effect, again, I'm just describing from within the university system, and I'm sure people would disagree with me, but what I see is enormous groups of administrators are in these uh, equity departments um, sort of, uh, again, use, using this as a way to gain power within the institution. Um, I think also it uh, even afflicts corporate life. Um, it's really the, a lot of the big American corporate brands um, uh, are avoiding scrutiny of their labor practices, avoiding scrutiny of their product offerings, avoiding all kinds of scrutiny because they drape themselves in the various diversity, equity, and inclusion flags. And so it's a, it's a way of deflecting criticism. So uh, does Amazon.com uh, uh, treat its workers badly? Well, there have been a lot of uh, studies, a lot of journalistic exposés of how um, you know, Amazon um, uh, lowers your score as an employee if you take too many bathroom breaks. You know, they see you, they you track your phone. They walk you see you walk across the shop floor, in effect, and take a bathroom break. Um, but if you last time I saw an Amazon uh, advertisement, I think it was during the Super Bowl last year. The Amazon advertisement was of um, a transgender employee who was almost had tears uh, in their mo their eye, uh, thanking Amazon. Thank you, thank you so much, Amazon. Amazon covered my gender transition. So, or do we? So it, it, it's, a, it's, a way, it's a way. It's a way to go of, to the bathroom. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a way of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there's a special exception. Yeah, <laughs> special exception. Um, no, no, no. But, but, but I think you're right that the, the, this um, call it this kind of conservative critical theory that Frank is pursuing here, I think, is very useful. Great, thanks, Ashley. Do you want to pick up a couple of things? From uh, that one, I hope is working. Or one yeah, of them. No, we don't know which oh, one works. Now, so. <laughs> yeah, I think this one will work. That's right. Thank you. 
Um, so Frank brought up an interesting point about democracy, which um, kind of melds with another question about sort of where, where are we going? What does the future hold? And I'm not really sure because the trajectory all seems to be in the wrong direction. Um, and some of the backwardness of the discourse around rule of law and democracy and so on is, is really, really astonishing. Um, because the main way that populations express their democratic will, that is via the nation state, um, is viewed with suspicion um, and elided with nationalism and, and sort of um, the legacy of the Second World War and fascism and so on is the implication, right? So anything that has the prefix national is viewed with suspicion. Um, and it's part of this sad mythology of World War II is that what led to some of the horrific um, political developments of that time was an excess of democracy, that it was the masses out of control. And so ironically, you start to privilege groups who supposedly can rise above the rabble. If you know anything about fascism, you know, you can rise above the masses, rise above the rabble. Ironically, now that is privileged as a kind of bulwark against the excesses of mass society and mass politics. Um, and so you get this idea that the more insulated from democracy, the more trustworthy a path. Um, and we saw this with COVID restrictions. Um, there was this sense that no one acts reasonably or at all unless there is some diktat from above. Um, and that to allow people to make choices meant that they would inevitably make the wrong choices. Um, and the will of the people is seen, is, is looked upon almost well, very, very widely at least as something that we should be suspicious of, something that needs to be controlled. Um, uh, so nobody ever acts unless it's it's in relation to sort of expertise or will, you know, people have to learn, the masses have to learn that the exercise of their own free will and their autonomy is a risk. And they should learn to recognize these risks. And it's the role of the expert and the technocrat and so on to to get people to recognize these risks. And there's a very good line, uh, Benza, in your book um, where you, you say independence and expertise have become such sources of political legitimacy that they no longer seek to su supplement democratic legitimacy, but to supplant it. And I think that's really true. And again, I think it's the saddest legacy of the Second World War that an anti-democratic, an anti-mass movement, um, that th the legacy of that, uh, what we've learned from uh, the rise of a highly anti-mass movement, anti-democratic movement, what we've gained is a permanent suspicion of democracy in the masses. I think that's really sad. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll get our panelists to kind of uh, conclude in a bit with some thoughts, I think, on what the proper role of the rule of law really should be or how the uh, in nation states and in the EU we should approach this question of the rule of law, what, how we should keep it within its right bounds. But uh, a few more questions, I hope, from the floor. So there's a gentleman who had his hand at the back and then there's uh, my colleague, Tony, towards the front. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Peter Tutu from the Foundation for Civic Hungary. I have a quick question about uh, the correlation between uh, economic development and the rule of law, because if you look at rule, the scholarship and rule of law, there is um, uh, there's a clear um, um, there's a clear connection between um, you know having a, a stable, foreseeable um, legislation, for example, that that benefits um, investment and business businesses and um, Looking at the case of Hungary, of course, um, it's, it was said many times, Hungary uh, is, is st striving to uh, be a member of those kind of countries. Um, so would you think that, that that's, or, or what's your take on this, uh, um, this um, correlation is that the rule of law is a, is a, is a, is a prerequisite to become uh, a highly developed nation? Yeah, the, the nice question. Uh, thanks. And so we'll come to my colleague uh, at the front. This is a especially valuable question because I think some people often think of rule of law as a concept that's wielded against, say, the right. And we must, I guess, look at the origins of rule of law thinking in lots of key kind of right wing or at least right wing economically uh, thinkers such as Hayek and others. But Tony. Thanks very much. Just like to ask the panel, what uh, say, if any, do you think the European Union should have over minority rights in nation states? 
because the uh, conversation uh, Benson referenced earlier that we had with a very interesting Spanish lawyer uh, around these issues, it would seem that you know, the, this uh, our Article 2 referral to the Court of Justice is pretty seismic. And it's basically saying, does the European Union have the right to assert minority rights? So, for example, same-sex uh, families being able to be represented in the media... Or does the nation state have the right to say, we want to protect children from coming across in the media or elsewhere? Because it's not just about education resources, it's about children coming across in the media and elsewhere. Uh, uh, um, uh, influences, values, ideas that uh, go against the culture of that country. So does the EU have any business uh, with regards to minority rights? Thanks, Tony. Very clarifying question. Um, any further points that people would like to catch from the floor? If not, I'll invite our, our panel to kind of sum up. And as I think ending this question of Tony or the proper place of the rule of law, the, the positive case, what the balance should be. Too many questions to kind of really nail in, in a minute or two. But I'll give you each a, a, a couple of minutes to just Maybe reflect the, on these things. the address can start now because I, every time I start it. Okay, sure. That's fine. Yeah. Which is a shame because I haven't had a chance to really think about that with these questions. Okay. Um, uh, I can't read my own writing. <laughs> I wrote down some notes. Um, so I think generally this question that you've asked where you said, what, what say should the EU have over minority rights? I think part of what underpins this is this idea that left countries left to their own devices will are, are choosing wrong. And that's why the EU needs to step in and give them these correct values. Instead of having a kind of open conversation and debate about the values at play. So you see this all the time where it's like the family becomes problematized as the site of the passing down of supposedly backward and problematic norms and values. And it's just taken for granted, therefore, that the EU or other institutions have a role in going into the education system and disrupting that passage of supposedly bad ideas, instead of recognizing that the way that uh, knowledge and norms and so values and, uh, and so on are passed down from one generation to the next is never just a carbon copy. It also involves change. And populations, uh, you know, left to their own devices do debate these sorts of things and it's just this idea that if you don't intervene if the eu doesn't say something then it's just the same thing on and on and on forever well if that's the case then you're kind of stuck for explaining social change historically too it's like if this institution doesn't intervene to give people the right values then it'll never happen and it, and, and then it's just sort of it, you problematize families you problematize individuals you problematize education and then, then there's very little space left for a state to decide these things because the assumption that we've just accepted when we even have this debate is that um, if you let countries choose, they will do the wrong thing and they we won't have progressive change. I think that's wrong. Great, thanks, Ashley. Uh, Gladden. <clears throat> we are entering the final moments where um, if one makes any bold comments about rule of law, it would probably be glib. Um, so I'll try not to be glib, but um, I would say that uh, overall, it, it, it seems like the, the idea of the rule of law has been colonized by a, a, a view that, that um, the purpose of law over time is to uh, liberate people more and more from their unchosen obligations. Um, and so we're, a, a lot of the typical terms of the debate, again, we'd have to discuss them more another time. Um, you know, this is not a debate that can just be settled by reference to national institutions or international institutions. Um, it will require, uh, as a part of the discussion, a recovery of the true understanding of law. Again, that's not something I can be, uh, uh, be glib about. But in the classical understanding uh, that was expounded by the Roman lawyers um, and developed through the, the Christian and classical tradition, a law is an ordinance of reason uh, published and ordered toward the common good. Um, and it's knowable by, by reason and comports with nature um, and even in, in some degrees has a, an ability to uh, um, you know, transcend different cultures that, that dis disagree upon it. So um, 
you know, there have been, I think, some some recent movements, at least in the uh, American world that I'm part of, um, to bring the ideas of the common good back into law. American law is very individualist and and liberal in that sense. Um, some of these move, one of these movements goes by the name of common good constitutionalism. Um, so all I can do as a as a pointer to future discussion um, is to say that bringing the idea of the common good back in um, may be a way that we can transcend the discussions and not just talk about um, federalism versus the the rights of states to be all completely different. Thanks a lot, Gladden. And Akos, hopefully you've had some time to leave us with some uh, further insights from your book. Uh, yes, so it will be the, 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 the concluding remarks will be also the answers to the questions. Uh, so the, first of all, economy and the rule of law. I think that uh, in the rule of law there is the concept of uh, legal certainty, and it is important uh, for the economy because it, you can foresee how, uh, how your investments will behave or in which uh, uh, institutional context, uh, legal context, uh, your, your investments will, uh, investment will work. So it's important and they were a kind of uh, criticism against Hungary in the beginning of the 2010s when there was a lot of laws uh, passed by the parliament uh, very quickly uh, and there was this criticism that there is legal uncertainty in Hungary but it turned out that it was a kind of crisis management uh, after the 2008 uh, economic uh, crisis and uh, the crisis left by the uh, by the social socialist liberal government uh, but uh, it, it ended up so it, it, it ended up in a clear economic policy uh, but there is a link, of course, uh, for 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 economy, uh, and uh, for as for the question of uh, uh, which right, the right of the parents, uh, or or which is more valuable, traditional family or modern family, and so on and so forth. I think that that can be a debate. Of course, there will be different standpoints. Uh, I think that traditional family is a value, so it cannot say not not be said that only. Uh, uh, rainbow families are value and traditional families are, are prehistoric creations. Uh, traditional family is a, uh, is, is a value, but uh, of course debate should, should be allowed and uh, there can be a debate on it. But I think that this is to be debated on the level of uh, the member states uh, because this belongs to the competence of the member states. It is not a European matter. Uh, and it, this come back, comes back, and this is my conclusion, uh, to the, at the very beginning we talked about the competences of the European Union. Uh, and I think that the, that the main point is that uh, the European Union, uh, European member states decided to give uh, power, uh, renounce uh, to power and uh, share the power, give the power, transfer the power to supranational institutions in uh, such fields like commerce, uh, uh, economic policy, uh, you know, some and some technocratic issues. Uh, and then they gave power to the supranational institutions, but they did not decide. To, uh, and <laughs> these supranational institutions are dealing with these questions uh, with this kind of democratic deficit as well. But uh, the country said no, no, no matter because even even if it's not democratically perfect, uh, the institutions, uh, EU institutions are not democratically perfect, for these kind of issues, uh, they can make the deal, they can uh, govern. Uh, but they never said this uh, for uh, such important issues like a constitution of a country uh, or family law, they didn't say so. And that is why in the treaties the competencies are um, are, are clearly limited and there are a lot of competencies that stay at the level of the member states and they should stay at the level of the member states because uh, the current institutional system of the EU is not uh, uh, not in the how to say not in the capacity of uh, dealing with them uh, in a in a good manner I think Great, thanks. So I do hope everyone will have a chance to read Benson's book. I hope you'll also get a chance to log on and read our report that we uh, published uh, that was referenced earlier. Uh, and also, I really hope that we'll see you at our next event, which I mentioned is next uh, Wednesday, the 29th. Uh, you can find out details about that on our website. We'd also love to stay in touch with you if you're new to us. So please come and uh, get a business card or give us yours. And we'd like to carry these conversations on. The conversation was mentioned uh, by Benson and by Tony about find a way to kind of bridge some of the divides of, the, of these polarizing issues is something that we're very interested in doing. So if you want to carry on this conversation with us formally or informally, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but for now, can we thank our speakers and then you can join us for a drink. <laughs>